Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now even today and with the latest high-end PC hardware it's very unlikely that you'll be able to play through 2007's Crisis without experiencing a few frame drops that will take the action below 60. It was created with future hardware in mind and at the time it seemed like gains in performance would be achieved thanks to higher processor clock speeds and not more cores and threads. As we now know, it's the latter part of the previous statement that reflects how things moved forward. Even if we can't maintain a solid 60fps throughout, mostly thanks to the intensive ascension map, there are still a lot of levels where this figure will be met and exceeded, and cranking up the graphical options results in a title that still holds up visually very well in 2020. When the game was ported to the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 a few years later, it became what I feel was one of the best looking 7th generation console games, and if you want to hear more about those versions then I'd recommend checking out my The Day That Crisis Came To Consoles video, the link to which will be in the description. Description. Two years after the release of the original PC Melter, and just nine months after the standalone expansion Crisis Warhead arrived on PC, Crisis 2 was officially announced in June of 2009. An urban jungle was going to replace the tropical island setting used in the first game, and also gone was the PC exclusivity. Yes, Crytek were embracing cross-platform development for this upcoming FPS. Between the announcement and eventual release in 2011, it's fair to say that numerous fans and gaming media outlets voiced their concerns. On one side of the coin you had PC gamers who worried that the inevitable dumbing down of the game for consoles would have a negative effect on the PC release, and on the other side you had console gamers who were themselves concerned that anything with the name Crisis in the title would run horribly on the already ageing hardware inside their chosen platform. The reality, however, was as follows. The Xbox 360 and PS3 releases run at 1152 by 720 and 1024 by 720 respectively. This was nothing out of the ordinary, as most 7th gen console titles targeted 720p or below, bar a few exceptions. The actual problem concerned the frame rate, which would drop down to the mid-teens during some intensive segments. Overall though, it still looked fairly impressive and wasn't totally unplayable, put it that way. But let's talk about the PC release. Because Crisis 2 was built with multiple platforms in mind, the minimum system requirements were actually quite lenient and anyone with an 8800 GT and Core 2 Duo or HD 3850 and Athlon 64 X2 could have expected to run the game with the 8800 GT, for example, pulling around 35 frames per second at 720p. This was, after all, a DirectX 9 release, so those with lower-end hardware had a far better chance of running the game smoothly. The lack of DX11 features at launch actually made for a fairly sore point, among others, but we'll get onto that shortly. If you were lucky enough to own a quad-core processor and high-end graphics card such as the GTX 480 then you could have taken advantage of the Extreme preset which offered the best visuals and ran fairly well on such a card. With modern hardware, even with well-priced budget GPUs such as the 1650 Super from Nvidia, you can expect a consistently solid frame rate. So I mentioned previously that Crisis 2 launched without DirectX 11 features, but it also had rather lacking graphical options. In fact, you could choose from about three presets. This all made for a rather controversial PC release, though as rumour suggested, Crytek had an ace up their sleeve, and that came in the form of a 2.35 gigabyte patch. Back in 2011, a 2 gig patch for an 8 gigabyte game was a pretty big deal, though it was well worth the free download. Included in the 1.9 version update were the sought after DX11 tweaks such as tessellation and displacement mapping. Improvements to the graphical menu and a high resolution texture pack were also present. The combination of these changes added an ultra setting to the game, and with these enhancements came a new recommendation. Instead of a 512MB 8800 GT or 3850, Crisis required that anyone looking to take advantage of these changes should have a 768MB GPU in their system or better, and be running a 64-bit operating system. 
Now this wasn't too far fetched as a lot of cards were already using 1GB of VRAM or more in 2011. It just meant that anyone using older Nvidia or AMD offerings would have had to stick with lower settings, which they had probably been doing anyway to retain a solid frame rate. Looking back once again to the 1.5GB 480 and here is how the game compared frame rate wise both pre and post 1.9. On the left we have the game maxed out under DX9 1080p and on the right we have the game maxed out under DirectX 11 with the high res textures enabled once again at 1920 by 1080 At a glance things don't look too different but the average and percentile frame rate does suffer when enabling all the fancy bells and whistles. The same can be said as far as performance with our modern 1650 Super goes. While you should have no trouble exceeding 60 frames per second at extreme settings under DX9, often going above and beyond 100 FPS, the performance is still noticeably affected when switching to DirectX 11. Still, it's unlikely that you'll see many drops below 60 here, and compared to its predecessor, the game runs very smoothly the vast majority of the time. I can't speak for the whole game as I haven't played every level, but I noticed the parts that cause frame rate dips on the consoles also cause them on PC, though it's less noticeable going from 100 FPS to 94 as opposed to 30 FPS down to 24. While bringing the Crisis franchise to console may have been deemed as controversial by some and downright betrayal by others, I personally think Crytek did a fantastic job with every version considering the hardware they had to work with at the time. This decision allowed a larger player base to familiarise themselves with a popular up and coming series and as I've covered before, a CryEngine 3 overhaul of the original game also came to PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 the same year. Despite what you may think about Crisis 2, it actually did pretty well in reviews as well and had sold over 3 million units by June of 2011. That said, it also went on to become the most pirated game on PC the same year, so what percentage of people actually played this on that platform isn't really known. So there we have it, whilst the core PC player base wasn't too well receiving of the news that Crisis 2 would be coming to current gen consoles at the time, I think it ended up being a pretty decent game and although there were certainly some frame rate issues on both the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, this was ultimately to be expected and towards the end of those consoles lifespans, this is something we started to see more and more of anyway. To this day, I think Crisis 2 and Crisis 3 of course, which also came to the consoles a little bit later on, as well as the original game, while we're at it, are still among some of the best visually impressive titles that you can find on 7th generation hardware, and it may still be worth checking them out. I know that the original is backwards compatible, and I think the same goes for 2 and 3 as well, so playing on an Xbox One X for example, if you don't have a PC to run them, might give you a better frame rate than the original consoles would. So there we have it. I hope you guys have enjoyed this what is a very slightly different video but due to the recent uh, well situation I am receiving a lot less deliveries at the moment so in between hardware videos I would like to upload a few more gaming based videos here on this channel but only based on the terms that I include some hardware related content as well because I love looking back at some of these old games in a sort of retrospective way but I also like detailing performance figures so that any of you who want to go back and play these older titles get an idea of how they run. Hopefully these videos aren't just me playing games they're also somewhat helpful. I made one about Battlefield 3 a couple of weeks ago as well but as for this video, as for Crisis 2 on the PC, it was seen as a pretty controversial release by some. It was the first time that Crytek were porting, or I shouldn't say porting, but developing a game for the consoles alongside the PC. So everyone was a little bit on edge what was going to happen. Was it going to be a mess on the consoles and a mess on the PC? Was it going to be perfect on all platforms? What we actually got then, was something that I feel was playable all around. PC gamers got a nice little extra graphical treat when that patch came out, which is always nice. And I still think it holds up visually today. 
Sure, it may not look as good as Crisis 1, which is still unbelievable for a 2007 game, but both Crisis 1 and Crisis 2, as well as Crisis 3, are still visually very appealing, and maybe I'll even make a video on Crisis 3 as well, if you want. I think it's pretty much the same as Crisis 2 in terms of technical details. I think it runs at a very similar resolution, but these are all things that I would love to look into. But there we have it. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like on it down below. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you want. It is free, but you don't have to. Stay safe, stay indoors, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one where we will be taking a look at another piece of hardware.